All right, so we're 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 back with Robert Toll. Uh, we got "Don't Be Dumb." I've been walking around with this kind of all week, kind of just peeking in, uh, just getting ready for you know our conversation. And and man, like I feel like I can learn a lot from you. I feel like you've got a lot of life experience. And you know, we talked about it. We kind of got your background last time. You know, world traveler. You know, experienced business guy. Um, but man, you're like pulling off everything that I'm like thinking of right now. So like you could be like a major resource to me. So I'm just going to kind of like, really just, you're going to give me like a consultation here if that's okay. Sold. Sounds like a deal. All right. So again, like, how did you do this? Like, how, just tell like, like who helped you? Like, I know, I know the, the creative just take us through that, uh, process and like who was there helping you, like lifting you up. Because I feel like that's what you could be for me, and then I could turn around and do it for others. You know, like that's my goal. That sounds fair. Okay. So, from writing the book, who for, was helping me? Yeah, or from, from writing everything? the book, from writing the book to getting it out to, like, you know, just helping you with your creative process. Like, okay, this is like how you write a book, type thing. That sounds fair. Um, well, the firm I was working with, they were supportive and sort of having a step by step process that you work through. Yeah. And that was very helpful with like, we could call in and ask questions or. Who was that? Who was the firm? They were uh, Igniting Souls. Igniting Souls. the name of the firm uh, out of Ohio. And they're like a book publisher? Okay. Yes. Um, so they helped out and they've done that. A friend of mine had uh, published with them. Okay. And so I got connected that way. And they helped and they had a lot of templates and sort of step-by-step process. Right. I will confess I didn't follow it completely. Right. Um, and really ended up at a place that it was sort of random stories from Robert. Yeah. That it wasn't making any sense at all. And I'd barely made any progress in like six months. Right. And it clicked finally that the music concept of songs and themes from songs. Yeah. I see that a lot of them there. You like reference Led Zeppelin, you reference, you know, uh, a lot of different type of music that kind of helped you relate your stories. Yes. Yeah. And once that clicked, Scott, it was like, then the majority of the book in a very rough draft fashion was written in a week. Yeah. Once it clicked. Right. So after six months of like a thousand words and then the majority was in like a week. Right. And then the editing process became, and that was very supportive. I used, um, they encouraged the use of beta readers. So people that I would, that I knew and trusted that would be for the target audience yeah. for them to read the first drafts of it and give feedback and help me adjust it from there. Gotcha. I also self edited it numerous times three or four times to get it to where it was less because in that speed it wasn't really good right at that point right and then i used a professional editor to that was associated with this other firm that did a great job of giving it the polish and getting it where it needed to get gotcha and then went with affiliate firms for the typesetting and for the cover design to get that where it needed to go that's awesome and as as you're going along is there financial investment you have to make along the way? There was. I chose to invest it all up front, the majority of it. Yeah. And then paid a little bit extra for the editing to have more editing support. Gotcha. And a little bit extra for the cover design to get it across and like even uploaded to like um, KDB and Amazon and so forth. Gotcha. That so it, you have, so you paid for help with distribution as well. Yes. Gotcha. How's it going? Like how, how, are the sales like, do you feel like you're getting like, what kind of support do you get in marketing and, and like the overall push behind, you know, what, what you've helped, you know, you've paid them to kind of help you out here. Is there anything that they're doing to kind of help move this thing? And like, where are you with it right now? Well, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's sold pretty well. Yeah. Not, you know, I'm proud of what we did. It didn't sell nearly has not yet sold as many as, you know, I'm still working for a living. Yeah. So, but it's uh, very, very helpful, and they have been supportive of, of me yeah. uh, throughout it and uh, had ideas for book reviews to get those out and done and reach out to people in advance to review the book on Amazon, yeah. which helped with that right? and got it off the ground to a good start. Uh, they also recommended a uh, like an official book launch. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that. Right. So uh, the idea is once I turn it into an, a um, – yeah, I would an, definitely an audio, I, an audio book. Oh, when it's the audio. See, that's where I I, I hate turning the page. Yeah. So like 
I just for for me, it's just intrusive and like it. I, I just don't like holding the book, and I have to strain my eyes. You know, my eyesight's not perfect, so I'm like in bed, like trying to, and I get frustrated because I'm like trying to peek at it. But the audio, I think, I think they should all run audio because you, you know, I, I get you know, Amazon prime and that equals like audio credits every month. Right. And, you know, I would love to, you know, hear your booming voice, read this book. Well, and really know? that's all my, my one hold back was, you know, I talked to other people and they were like, well, we have somebody else record it. And it's like, but this is so much in your voice that it almost doesn't make sense for somebody else to do the um, recording of the book. Right. So just need to cycle back and get a little time in the next period of time to record the audio book. Yeah. Well, I love the, the one thing that I took mainly from this is that you've had a lot of jobs that you weren't really qualified for and you just made True. them work. You just made them work and like people believed in you. You believed in yourself. And like it's that was that was the funnest part of the story is like hearing like the guy that um, the guy that walked out pissed off and was like hire Robert for the job. He knows it better than everybody. Like, yep. yeah, I like that was, that was the, the funnest part of the story for yeah, me. Yeah. And then I got the surprise when, you know, I wanted to go for it. Yeah. But I thought there'd be like transition time. Right. And instead it was like, congratulations, you've got the job in like 30 minutes and then you start tomorrow morning. <laughs> right. And I was like, oh, okay. Right. And literally went to the library to pick up books on the topic. Right. Of finance because I was completely unqualified. Honestly, I think the best education comes from the street. Like whatever you going to school for, like use us as an example. Use us as an example. Look, whatever you think you're passionate about and you're going to invest in, like that's almost like why I don't like college anymore too, right? So mm -hmm. they're going and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on on this piece of paper that, you know, if they're anything like you and me, we just run out and like find the best opportunity for us in our life and and go after that. Well, absolutely, and and actually, I'm very distantly like distantly related to louis lamore the western author ah very i mean like 1600s type of distance right. so 14th cousins 15 <laughs> times removed <laughs> but one of his statements was you know go to the library and learn yeah that's education isn't a one-time thing right you want to know more go to the library learn more continue to educate yourself that matters more than any formal education it, that's absolutely true i believe that 100 percent. so like unless you actually have a path that you know, like that's what you're set out to do in this world. I would just, I would just go get experience, life experience, you know, instead of wasting all that money. Um, well, when I did that while I was going to school, to worked many different jobs while going to undergrad. Did you ever use your history thing though? Like I use it every day. Okay, good. I just don't use it how you would think you, I would. You use don't it. use it in making a living, right? Right. Well, sort of, but not. Yeah. Because in an ability to write, to research, to the, analyze. The research of history, yeah. The, okay. to, to know how to research topics, yeah. to source what's, where okay. you found your information. Interesting. All that's been very, very critical. And it's not something they teach you if I'd gone to business school. Right. As an undergrad, they don't teach you that type of thing. Interesting. That is interesting. So it actually gives me a little bit of an edge in some ways when you think of consulting, of writing things up. Right. I was uh, recently working with another um, consultant, and he talked about being in the flow zone. Of right. things that just come just naturally to you and just it's energizing, not de energizing. Right. And that type of thing is very energizing to me. Yeah. So you're using your skill set in different ways that are helping you in your entrepreneurial Ah, yeah, that's awesome. Right. Yeah. So it all messes together. It all somehow just comes together. Now if you'd asked me in my twenties whether the history degree was worth it, right. I would have told you not. Yeah. But now you reflect back and you say, oh, well, I, I got now. this skill because I was able to get that mm -hmm. education. Yeah. Hmm, but, at the, but at the time, I didn't see that. It was more frustration of I got a history degree. I graduated in three years. Right. I woke up and went, oh, now I got to get a job, <laughs> a full-time job. Right. Now what am I going to do? Right. And uh, struggled with that a bit right at the beginning. Well, hey, man, I want to I want to get into some, um, you know, just have you explain some things. You know, like people, we don't want to take them away from buying the book or reading the book. But it might just be a different, it might just hit different if we're hearing you talk about sure. it, you know? Absolutely. So um, let's talk about seeing the elephant. Just All right. Just tell us the story. What's seeing the elephant? Well, seeing the elephant is a uh, American military term. 
for basically going into combat and emerging the other side. Hmm. Of basically, you've you've seen the elephant. You've it's also has somehow times tied to like the circus. Have you been to the big event? You've seen it. Hmm. You've done it. But it's it started with the military of saying you you've been through combat. And for me, very much the inspiration for writing the book was you know waking up with a police officer at the foot of the bed. You know, having had a seizure and my wife taking care of me and not having a clue what happened. I mean, seizures are really easy for me. I don't have a, I don't have any memory of them. Right. No big deal. Right. She'd tell you a different story. It's, it, it's was a much, it, was a, it was a big deal. Yeah. And within an hour, they'd taken me to the hospital and you know, locally here. And they said, we can't treat you here because you have a brain tumor hmm. and had to make a choice of what hospital to go to, to have it removed. Yeah. So that experience was huge of, when they tell you you might not remember your wife, you might not know how to speak, you might not see, you might not hear. Okay, but if I leave it in there, I'm going to die. Yes. Okay, get it out. <laughs> let's yeah. let's make it go away. Right. And then the fact that they tried to cut the um, the blood supply off to the tumor the day before the operation, and they lost me on the table. Wow. And didn't tell me that until the next morning when I'm going in. They're going, "Oh, we need to shave your beard." Well, why do you need to shave the beard? well, there was a little problem yesterday and we couldn't get you intubated and we couldn't this and that. And it's like, so is it okay if we shave the beard? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> let's, you know, you could have told me that last night. I would have shaved it myself, you know. Right. Yes, make it go away and let's get on with it. Wow. And then the fear of seeing the fear in my wife's eyes and my kid's eyes, because they were there when they told me that and they dropped that bomb on us. You know, not not a pretty thing to see that. Yeah. But I emerged very quickly, walked out of the hospital a few days later, and within a month I was traveling and working in California. Still didn't look real good because they opened me up from one side to the other. But I was fine. No rehab, no nothing. Came out ambidextrous. Came out ambidextrous, better hearing, uh, better hand-eye coordination, um, better eyesight. Don't need the glasses all the time anymore. Wow. And the only thing I did was I lose the lost the sense of smell, mm. which is fine. That's a good trade off. That's a I'll good trade off. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's one of those things we have to keep monitoring. Quite frankly, it's uh, down to once a year type of monitoring now with an MRI. Um, had an incident last year, not long after we talked, where I had one seizure that something happened. It's just one of those freak things. So but, you're still subject to. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have to take like anti seizure medications just to be safe. Gotcha. Because the thing was like the size of a small apple yeah. in my frontal lobe. It right. was huge. Right. Uh, so I actually broke my right arm falling out of the bed in August. Oh, my gosh. Which snapped it off right near the um, the shoulder joint. Wow. And But it healed up so well with the work that we did. It healed up so well that the, um, the orthopedic surgeon and so forth, all the folks I was looking at couldn't even see it and had to go back to old x-rays to find out where the break was. Oh, wow. So in the final x-ray, you couldn't even see where it had been broken. So you're, I mean, the way that you heal now is even remarkable. It wasn't bad, I'll tell you. It wow. didn't feel it didn't feel real good at the time. Yeah. But wow, I don't feel good for the folks in the ambulance of what I did because apparently I, the adrenaline gets pretty strong in those type of moments, Scott. So right. I bet I, I sort of went back and forth between being awake and not. And the next thing I know, I'd pulled all the IVs out of my arms and in the back of the ambulance. And wow, they were earning their money that night. Oh, I'm sure. Well, um, let's see what else we got here that I wanted to touch on. All right. So, you know, there's just a lot of encouragement in here, you know, like the, uh, you know, keep going if you know you're right. You know, like, like for me right now in this podcast, you know, like we don't get a ton of views. We don't get a ton of views, but I know that I'm interested in doing this. I, I know that there's compelling stories here in the New River Valley. Um, I want them to tune in. You know, I want them to do, I, I, I think I've got the right vision. I'm executing. I'm not executing probably as good as I probably know how I can, but we're still here doing it every every week, mostly. Um, you know, what what encouragement do you have for somebody that is like me, you know, that is like trying out things, take, like, like uh, I know in the book you were like, you know, you had a boss one time 
that had a bunch of ideas. He, that he had just idea after idea after idea. You were trying to help him execute these ideas. And by the time you got to the point where it could be executed, he was off to the next deal. I think my staff would tell you that's, that's kind of like me. Yeah, that's and he, like he was, he's absolutely brilliant yeah. and gone on to multiple businesses since. But he would, like, shoot the horse dead. It's like you're just about to get it executed to – in a good way. Right. And he'd be moving on to something else. Yeah. So help me, help me not do that. Give me some encouragement to like, like, um, honestly, like, I think, I think I'm, I'm taking their direction. Like they're trying to harness me. They're trying to harness me, put me in the right direction and keep me focused on like the original thing I said, instead of deviating to all these other different things. So how did you handle that? How did you handle trying to keep this man like, on track or could you could you he it was challenging with him yeah. but you see it in lots of environments i would say a couple things first of all i'm a big fan of list mm-hmm. whether it's on a spreadsheet or whether it's in a book or a notebook mm-hmm. of what are the things and what are the prioritized things that are the most important yeah and keep focused on that and if something changes that's okay but know that i consciously changed direction and i took idea number one and now it became idea number four right and it's still on the list or put it on the shelf and it's a six month idea. We'll go back to that one. We're not going to do that one right now. Yeah. But make it conscious versus just sort of flow of whatever happens on the day to day basis. Yeah. Would be one thought. The other is not let the, um, the perfect be the enemy of the good, which is so frequent for folks that you want it to be done just exactly the way you need it to. Right. I've heard it the other way around, like good is the enemy of perfect. But I see what you're saying too, because, you know, I mean, at some point you got to be, I mean, you got to know what you're doing is good and like not be too hard on yourself. Right. You know? Well, and it, I mean, I'd give the example of even the book. I have one good friend of mine read it and came back with all the places where there were typos in it and sent me after it was published. Oh. And what I did was said thank you to him and I appreciate it. <laughs> and that'd be great. So when we do version two and we put second out edition. the second edition, <laughs> we'll fix them all. <laughs> yeah. But I knew I reached a point where we could keep editing the thing forever. Yeah. And there would still be mistakes in it. Right. Or launch it and get it done and get it delivered. Yeah. And then go from there. Yeah. So that would be an example of that where you could get yourself in a bad trap of this has to be the absolutely right thing. And you think about how they write software. So it's aggravating sometimes, but software is never perfect. Yeah. That they put out. Right. Think of the updates on the phone. Yeah. It's an update. It's an upgrade. It's a fix of a bug. It's a fix of that. Yeah. Think of it that way. And, uh, but they got the software out there and people are using it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm like, I'm searching to try to find the attention and where it's at so I can get more views on this stuff and get more community involvement. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm the only thing, I'm the only one doing something like this. I'm the only one like putting myself out there in these situations to try to like be that, you know, be that person that uh, people turn to for information and like, you know, the Joe Rogan of the new river Valley, Mm -hmm. you know, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to influence this community. I'm trying to make an impact here. You know, I've chosen to live my life here, you know, like I've chosen this area because I grew up here. My family's here. Like I want to expose this community to the world to know that this is a nice little area that you can make your life in and have a nice life. Um, You know, too many people, too many people here that are from here think that they got to leave and they, they, they think that they've got to, to go off and the grass is greener. And I just want to tell them that, you can have the life you want here. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And and it was actually the way I was raised with moving a lot. My parents did a fantastic job of you're always looking forward to what you're experiencing, not looking backwards to what you might have left behind. Right. And so it can apply for the New River Valley is look at all the great things we have here. Yeah. Enjoy that. Don't look out and say, oh, I wish I was someplace else or I wish I was doing this or I heard about this place that would be great. Yeah. Focus on where you are and enjoying that. Right. It devastates me when I hear people say they they hate their life here. There's nothing to do, like all that stuff. Like they're not able to earn the income they think that they're capable of. Like all that, all that. And that's yeah, really, I'm just, 
So I'm, that's the goal for me is to show them that you can create something here. You can like, you can um, have whatever it is you want in life. Right. Well, and I can tell you, having spent 11 years in New Jersey, I knew it was lower cost here. Right. You know, I knew it would like real estate. I knew it was lower cost. Yeah. I had no idea how much better everything was in cost, <laughs> whether it's just a local fast food place or gas right. or groceries. I mean, everything the, is the, less. So I, yes, you might not be able to earn as, maybe you couldn't earn as much as you could in Los Angeles, but it's not going to cost you what it costs to live in Los Angeles either. Yeah. What I've heard about property taxes in these big metropolitan areas is re- is crazy compared to what we have here. My property taxes in New Jersey were $18,000 a year. Yeah. Yeah. A, a couple million dollar home is not that much here, you know? It's right. Like, Absolutely not. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's just like, you know, this has encouraged me a little bit further, you know, down the line, you know, cause you know, I want, I want to get your advice on like, relationships too, like, you, you know, you have, you have a family, you have a wife, kids, right? Um, like give us some, give us like how important that was to you in like your, your development, your career, your, like, you know, your ability to do this. I'm sure that had an influence on all of that. Absolutely. I mean, the family has always been very, very supportive, but you try to have it be a two way street yeah. where you're supportive of them too. Right. So I think that's important uh, to find that right balance. I think I probably have a very tolerant family because I've had times when I just sort of go off and I'm, you know, working 12 hours or 15 hours a day and they don't see much of me or anything like that. And they've been tolerant of that, trying to do better and balancing things out a little bit. Um, So that's been, you know, a learning for me. But it's also good to have people around you that are tolerant and supportive of your ideas and your your notions and so forth. And then each of them has helped in their own way through the years, in different ways, whether it's my oldest son is a, a tech grad, so he helps sometimes with the finance or the spreadsheets and that type of thing. Nice. That for my business. And it was like, can you help me out and take a look at this and build something out for me? And he'll spend some time on his, on his weekend to help me out with that. That's awesome. And then other members of the family have helped out with conferences and supporting that way and so forth. Right on. So that's real positive. So you used to you used to go around and like you used to run events. You'd have people show up. You would do like the conference thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Tell me about that. Like I I've, I'm interested in getting on stage at some point and like doing that same kind of thing. How did you get started in doing that? You know, I started it before I was doing consulting, actually. Yeah. So if I go back in time to when I was working for, um, even for the company with the guy that was continued with all sorts of interesting ideas, yeah, we you know had uh, annual conferences, and I had to do the financial side of the update, which was the most boring mm. part of the update that anybody had ever seen. Put the whole audience to sleep. <laughs> and a friend of mine and I, he was very good at the audiovisual things. And we came up with the concept of a financial weather report. And so we actually did the green screen with me saying, you know, it's raining profits in this section of the country. <laughs> and it's snowing this and it's freezing this way. And, you know, it's you know wind blowing in this way and made it a very much of a recorded experience that became the highlight of the conference, right. you know, 20 something years ago. And then it evolved over time to these different conferences that I would go and do speak at workshops, have a workshop, those type of things. And then once I started doing consulting in 2013, we'd frequently go to different types of conferences and not only have the booth where you'd talk at the booth and be able to talk to potential clients, which is interesting. It's a good way to build a client base. But then mainly we found that holding the workshops that are more intimate environments, like 20 people, Mm. 30 people on a different topic that made a lot of sense to them, would get you better leads and better relationships with people that you could follow up with than standing on the top of the stage and talk to a thousand people. Right. Thousand people, we tried that and it didn't do much for us. Mm. But a smaller 20 to 30 person audience where you could talk and have break time and talk afterwards and maybe go out to dinner with them. So the goal, the goal there is to get in front of them and then on the back end at the booth, 
sell them the product, Absolutely. sell them the sell them the service or whatever. Yeah, you no, know, at least expose them to the notion and know what they need. Gotcha. Because I'm I'm much more focused on. I mean, you can't. We had an experience recently uh, with a client that you can you can't force that horse to drink the water. Yeah, you can't. You can talk about how great that water tastes and look at how wonderful that is and isn't that great and oh, it's cool and refreshing, but you can't make them drink that water. Mm. But focus on what do they need and understand that and explain what you're offering, how that helps them meet those needs and solve their problems. Mm. Then you're on the road to, you know, making a sale. Yeah. It's interesting how I want to like tie in, you know, my love for this community with the real estate sales, you know, you know, with because I'm I'm passionate about the area. How do I get how do I get that word out about the area that would also lead to me selling houses? Because it's not really all about the houses for me, you know. Like that's how I that's how I bring in most of my money, but that's not my ultimate goal. My ultimate goal was push this area to more people, have more people come into this area that will bring value to the area, businesses, families, you know, business people. And then obviously I'm the resource that brought them in that would lead to. So how, how I want to know how I can encompass that in the whole conference thing, like the, pretty much just developing a brand like you see Gary V or Grant Cardone or, like even what you're trying to do, really, like right. you, you know, you go on a book tour, you stand on stage talking about don't be dumb, you know, that's going to lead them to know who you are more, look into you more, and then, it's not, and it's not just about the book sales; it's about potential consulting opportunities right. too. Where people go, okay, I like what this, how this guy thinks. Right. Maybe he can help me with right. his business, with right. my business. Right. So it's very similar. So I don't know. You probably could look for different. You know, I'm, I'm just making things up at this point. Yeah. But if it's folks, when you think of all the. Um, like the river track and, and traffic and the kayaking and things like that. Yeah. If there's events for selling sports equipment and so forth like that, that you could help promote. I mean, even the then, I know there's community the, groups, there's community groups that run the fork and cork and, you know, I've done interviews with them and the, the people that run uh, stepping out and right? stuff like that, like trying to be more involved with them, I guess could lead to right more of a, mutual connection there. I, I mean, I'm just, you know, but if we're you're just, talking about getting people to come visit and then fall in love with the place, right? it might be going to a convention in Charlotte yeah. and speaking about on behalf of some of these events and so right. forth. And I know that there's, um, you know, bids out there for um, like different type of sporting events, like youth stuff, mm-hmm. like that brain, that brain tourism pretty much. Maybe look into trying to help support the tourism group for the New River Valley. Well, and think about the hotels that bring people in. Right. How engaged are you with their like food and beverage directors or right. their their folks that are their their big ticket sales? Right. And you probably ought to engage with them. Yeah. And I've got things that they could take advantage of. You know, I have the moving truck. I have right. the, like if they need to move a bunch of food from one place to the to the next that doesn't need refrigeration, you know, or they need to move a bunch of tables and chairs, you know, they could call me instead of you know renting a U-Haul or something like that. Well, and it's probably not even like an H column old eighty two Chevy van that doesn't want to start. Right. Like exactly. What I, like I had to drive <laughs> doing catering. So. Right. Right. Just a lot of ideas, you know. Um, so I appreciate you spit. I mean, that's just spitball and yeah. stuff. But know? I think the connection with the hotels makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, typically, I'd have to check with like the local between Radford and Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. What do they do during the summers of bringing on campus activities? Right. Because oftentimes people come for conventions or conferences there. Yeah. So that could be an opportunity to engage with people from outside the area. Yeah. And, and let's just be honest, like winter is here in the real estate game. Mm. Winter has come. 6% interest rates. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, no inventory. Buyers looking to buy that can't that can't get in. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, I know my sales, my sales units are down. I know across the board, most agents' units are down. Um, and, you know, who knows what, who knows what's happening? So, like, you know, these strategies and implementation and like real skill matters now. 
Oh, it does. Know? It does. And, you know, having the opposite effect I saw when I bought in Houston, the market crashed in 82. Yeah. When I bought in 96, the market still wasn't at the level it was in 82. Right. It was several years later before it ever got back to where it had been in the early 80s. Right. So that was the opposite side of the problem, but it was still a problem. Yeah. And what you're facing here is that loss of inventory. You, you're going to have to be more on your game. You're yeah. going to have to be more precise in how do you engage with people and get things done. And they probably, you know, have to, you know, people are going to have to be willing to like really put themselves out there to oh, buy yeah. a place. And how do you encourage them with that without it looking like it's against their best interest? Right. Because you got to escalate so high and you got to, you got to waive contingencies that normally you wouldn't waive. Uh, so it's, it's, there's, there's some fear. Oh yeah. There's some fear in the market, but you know, if you're working, working with the proper people and I mean, you know, 6% rate is better than the rent rates, you know, it's better than paying, you know, these it's better than what the mortgage rates were in the seventies and eighties. Right. Trust I mean, me. I mean, my first home in 2004 was 6% in right. 2004. Right. So, I mean, it's not that out of, it'll, whack. it'll be okay. Yeah. It'll be okay. Yeah. But uh, you have to get inventive on things as far as selling properties. Yeah. I know I was thinking today about selling the first house in Arizona and had to sell it. Real estate agent had no idea how to sell it because <sighs> the people next to us had, it was horse property and they'd bulldoze their whole property. Oh my gosh. And they put a dumpster in their front yard, big <laughs> giant brown dumpster <laughs> for horse manure. That's hilarious. Which didn't smell good and standing at the kitchen window with a cup of coffee didn't look good either. Right. <laughs> and the realtor had no idea what to do with it, how to sell the thing. Right. And I came up with the concept in desperation of it, go f embrace it versus fight it. And so every bit of the ads became horse property for sale. Horse, 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 horse. And even encouraged the prospective buyers to talk to the lady next door. Because you guys could even go in half on the dumpster. Right. And if each of you could save money. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Right. And and the thing sold right. within a matter of weeks. Nice. Once we solved it, but it was one of those situations like, how do you deal with a dumpster in the front yard? Right. How do you sell this thing? Yeah. Good stuff. That that matters. It does. It, I mean, th to have somebody that has no clue other than putting a sign up and putting an MLS right now, that's not that's not going to cut, cut it. it. Not going to cut know? it. Now, it might I, representing you as the buyer. That's the challenge right now. The seller. I mean, sellers, uh, the only problems they have is dealing with all the offers that they're going to get. Well, that, and I, as I understand it, there's a lot of like what type of mortgage people are pre-approved for. Yeah. They're having to be very picky of like, okay, well, this type, if it doesn't appraise at the right level, yes. we got a problem here. Yeah. So you've got to straighten that out. And right. You know, maybe you ought to go with a different type of mortgage right now yeah. than what you wanted. Yeah. And you want to see, as a seller, you want to see the people that have the cash. You want to see that they can survive and eliminate the appraisal contingencies. Right. You know, and that's the, that's the scariest part about it is yesterday I locked one in and they had to, they had to just, they're going to, they're going to sell a home. They're going to have a nice little cash out, but the new home they're buying, they're just going to have to pay for it because like whatever it appraises for, they're going to have to make up the difference if it's short because they want it so bad. They're willing to do that. They're willing to do it, you know, but they're willing to ride out the rest of their life there. Like they know they're going to raise their family, which is, you know, they've got young kids and a foster and like, they know that they're going to be there for 15 years. Well, you better be like my wife who calls these mountains, her mountains. Right. Exactly. She has no, she has no desire to ever move any place ever again. So, right. I have a feeling my moving days are done. So how does that make you feel? The guy that's moved every three years, like, are you, like, are you feel bottled up? Like not being able to move to that next, next situation? I don't feel bottled up. I love yeah. the area. Yeah. I actually, it's one of those, it wasn't with a plan that I ended up here. Right. Although we'd visited frequently, all my family moved to this area. Never really had the plan to do it. Um, but I really fallen in love with the area. I think it's great in so many different ways. Yeah. And there's always opportunities to travel and go see new things. So yes. why not take advantage of lower costs and a great place that you, you know, to, to work and live yep. and then go see places if you want to see places. That's always been my goal is to home base this place and jump to wherever I want for the couple of weeks I want to be there and then come home. That's, that's what I've always wanted. Well, in the consulting environment still, we had a recent, um, myself and, um, the guy that's working with me uh, had an assignment in Pennsylvania, in rural Pennsylvania. 
that we spent a good amount of time up in over between February and April. Yeah. And so that was a completely new experience and some of it good, some of it bad, but staying in the boyhood home of James Buchanan, one of our presidents, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, meeting a guy that coached at the Mercersburg Academy, that uh, same place Jimmy Stewart went to school. Nice. And I don't think they quite overlapped. Right. Guy, <laughs> Carl was a little older, but he wasn't that old right. to have coached Jimmy Stewart. But it was still sort of a cool, see some place you'd never get to otherwise yeah. without consulting. So what's what's on the horizon for you? What's next for you? I know I know you're pushing this, but last time we talked, I think you said that you were you were getting ready to start working on the next project. Like, you, yeah, I actually have outlines for eight more books whoa, in process. Whoa. Um, nice. As, as a starting point. Nice. And I've gotten the rough, rough draft of the next one done. Awesome. So it's probably more comprehensive than Don't Be Dumb. Yeah. And it's focused more on entrepreneurs and how to start your business and sort of taking through step by step of getting to having a successful business. Yeah. And even like you said, of getting it home based where to run without you. Yeah. That type of thing resonated with me. It makes a lot of sense. Right. And um, getting that going. And one of the things I'm doing, and be interested if you, you want to take up the opportunity, is I'm interviewing other entrepreneurs. So it's not just Robert's perspective. I would love to be involved with that. Yeah. But having interspersed in the book, yeah. you know, a, set, a standard set of questions to entrepreneurs and then taking pieces and parts and put it in the book because it has more meaning to other entrepreneurs, I think, yeah. than just my perspective. Yeah. And like, you know, you got to do some research. You got to do some research every now and then. If you ever, like, I am ready to help out wherever you need. Fantastic. So just let me know. I really appreciate that. Yeah, very nice. I'm excited. I'm excited that you've got so much going on because even in the last episode, I said, you know, the best artists just deliver, you know, they, they get, they, they get through their process Whatever they, you know, writing, painting, music, they just get it out. They get it to the market. They they learn from it. Then they're moving on to that next deal. They're moving on to that next deal. Well, it's very interesting. I'm working with a different publishing support group this time. Yeah. That has like weekly calls where you're doing like on Messenger, having different types of Zoom calls and things like that. Nice. But it was very interesting that uh, she's been very successful at launching best-selling books. Wow. But I can see why, because she's sitting there at one point in like March. She was like, all right, 20 minutes a day, you're going to write, all of you, on this call. And when you and you provide evidence that you wrote. And if you don't, I'm charging you $500. <laughs> <laughs> and you talk about inspiration. It was like we, we had a month or so of we were talking and we are working. And yeah. then she was like, she just lit us on fire. And I tell you what, it inspired me because I went back and I dug into writing that I'd done 20 something years ago mm. that needed a lot of work, but I had a, like a trove of stuff that I could pull from, rework it, move it around, make, update it. And it got me inspired to make the progress I did. Yeah. Very much did. How much did your condition motivate you to like really put this in action? 100%. Or were you if, like, if, I mean, it sounds like you were debating and contemplating and and half-stepping until that happened. Yeah, the notion had been there. Yeah. Scott had been there for me to write something or, you know, potentially something about business. It had been. Yeah. And I'd written things back in the history degree of things that were in the Handbook of Texas that okay. were published. Little articles on towns that aren't around anymore. Gotcha. So I'd had that flavor back when I was in undergrad and... uh but this was the inspiration that said, yes, this needs to be done. Gotcha. It absolutely was. Well, when you get into that process and you need edits, like you, like I, you, dude, I would love to get first draft, like whatever it Don't. is. Like I would love to be there to like look over that. And um, when this hits audio, I'm going to get, I'm going to get the audio. I'm going to get through all of it. All right. And uh, I'm going to get a pen here. I need a, you need to carry a Sharpie around. Just start. I don't have a Sharpie. So I got a radio pen. <laughs> All right. There we go. We can sign on the inside cover. Here. Um, but, man, I really appreciate you being here. I know we, we kind of ju – I jump all over the place. So I'm good with that. You know, so – but um, I appreciate your relationship. I appreciate, uh, you know, your time. And, like, let's just continue as you continue to progress. We continue to just chat it up and, yeah, just uh, be there for each other. Kinda. Fantastic. Cool, Absolutely man. appreciate the support. Yeah, man. Well, we'll talk to you next time. Hey, everybody, I appreciate 
you're tuning in. Uh, we're still trying to get our thousand subscribers on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching on any other platform, listening on any other platform, please jump over to YouTube and give us a subscribe over there. And um, until next time, this was episode 36, Finding Your Place. Um, you know, we're just going to keep doing it. We're just, we're not going to stop. So, uh, we, we hope you tune in. We hope you enjoy the content. And, um, if you ever have any questions, um, just let us know and we'll try to handle those until next time. Thanks for watching.